What's going man? What's up? And welcome back to another video. In today's video, we're going to have another reaction video to a true McDonald's horror story animated. I'm pretty sure this is just one story this time and not the three stories because it don't say three stories. But if you want to watch the original video, the link going to be down below in the description. So make sure y'all check that out and let's go ahead and get into this one. Until that fateful night at a McDonald's in my small Alabama town. Fresh out of school, the job was supposed to be a simple way to earn some cash, but what transpired that night was anything but simple. The evening began typically enough, with the usual bustle of customers in the familiar routine of preparing fast food. Fries, burger patties, buns, ice creams, more fries, apologizing to an angry customer even though it isn't your fault, few online orders here, covering the coffee shifts there, and just when you sit down to scroll a few mindless TikToks, fries again. However, as the night progressed and the customer flow dwindled, an unusual patron caught my attention. A woman in a tattered mm, raincoat. Her hair was dark, her eyes unnervingly focused on me. She ordered a coffee and sat in a dimly lit corner of the restaurant, her gaze never wandering from my direction. We well, yeah. My bad. When y'all be seeing people like this, right? What be y'all y'all first initial like reaction and thoughts to these kind of people me my first thing is always like man they just must be on coke or something because there's no way like they're just being thrown by choice so like what 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 would be y'all like our initial reaction to this kind of stuff like look at her she damn near on coke it actually took me some time to figure that i was being checked out now, I don't mean to brag, but I have had my fair share of could cut her with this jawline moments. Right. I was half genetics and half malnutrition that did it. But hey, if poverty can make you look sexy, what's the harm, right? Anyway, I tried to shake off the eerie feeling she gave me, dismissing it as mere fatigue or perhaps my imagination running wild. The hours ticked by and the diner gradually emptied leaving an oppressive silence in its wake. That's when my co-worker, the only other person in the restaurant, suddenly collapsed. Mm. The shock of it jolted me from the numbness of my routine. One moment, he was washing the fryer and cribbing around his girl, who has a thing for his credit cards. The, the next the moment, his face was rushing to meet the ground. I rushed to his side, finding him unconscious but breathing. I grabbed him and somehow managed to get him to his car, advising him to get some sleep. His girlfriend's place was two blocks away, so even though I offered to drop him, he was sure that he was fine. I don't know, bro, he said. Yo, one moment I was fine, and then it felt like, I don't know, like I was tied to a tree and people were burning fire all around me. The temperature mm. rose and dropped, bro. I tell you, that refrigerator is going to be the death of me. That shit is broken, yo. The parking lot was quiet, almost unnaturally so, and I felt a chill in the air as I watched him drive away. Returning to the diner, I found the woman had left, but her raincoat remained, hanging over the back of the chair like a spectral reminder of her presence. Approaching her table, I noticed something peculiar, a tissue, crumpled and discarded. On it, in jagged, almost frantic handwriting, was a message that sent a shiver down my spine. Why is he Convince her them, shit? or they will think it is you. The words were ominous, cryptic, and unsettling. I pondered their meaning, a growing sense of unease taking hold of me. And as the night idea. deepened, strange and disturbing sounds began to fill the diner. It started with soft, desperate pleas for help. Voices that seemed to come from nowhere and everywhere all at once. Then came the screams, agonizing cries that echoed through the empty restaurant, filled with pain and terror. To my growing horror, the distant crackling sound of a fire joined the party, intensifying in volume and urgency. The situation was soon spiraling into madness. I decided to leave to escape the nightmare that was unfolding around me, but my escape was thwarted when I found the door inexplicably locked, sealed right. shut from the inside. I had the keys and I dropped my colleague Bill to his car. There was no way someone would have closed it. My attempts to open it were futile. 
so I turned, Listen, ignored buddy, the voices cool. and the screams, and rushed to the back door, very certain at this point that whatever was happening wouldn't bring any good news. But this is when I knew that I was screwed. The back door was sealed shut as well. The realization that I was trapped inside with the escalating sounds of terror was paralyzing. The diner, once a place of mundane work, had transformed into a scene from a horror story. The cryptic message, the locked doors, the haunting sounds, all these elements intertwined, creating a tapestry of fear and confusion. You know, all this, all this stuff that, that Buddy is talking is good, but you know, honestly, the type of the type of person I am, bro, I would have went home when the when the other dude went home, no cap, and I and the store would have been closed for the night. The manager would have been tripping. I would have told him like, bro, he fainted, and I'm not running this. I couldn't run this place by myself, bro. Like, what do you expect? And I would have went home the same as him. It's crazy that he stayed in here by himself and finished his shift. That's that's like our outrageous behavior, you know. I was caught in the midst of it, alone and bewildered, facing a night that was quickly turning into something out of a ghost story. Trapped inside the diner, the cacophony of screams and the crackling fire began growing McDonald's around me, person. my sense of reality began to blur at the edges. The diner, once a haven of greasy Double comfort food, had transformed into a nightmarish landscape. I felt a primal fear take hold, the kind that grips you in the dead of the night when every shadow seems alive. As I paced frantically, searching for any means of escape, the diner's lights flickered ominously, casting eerie shadows across the walls. It was then that I first saw them, horrifying apparitions, figures with severe burn injuries, their expressions contorted in pain and anger. They seemed to notice me, reaching out with charred hands, only to vanish as soon as they touched me. Their presence was both terrifying and heart-wrenching. In a desperate attempt to understand what was happening, I ventured into the back of the restaurant, a section I rarely visited. There, hidden behind old storage racks, I discovered a decayed part of the building I never knew existed. Mm. I mean... I had been there a few times, but I could swear that there was a wall at that place. That was somehow gone. In its place was a small, dusty room that looked out of place, as if something from the past- Alright, let's- come on now, that shit does not like- like, look at this door, bro. That shit is not inviting. That shit does not look welcoming, and he's gonna walk right into it. That's crazy. Why would you- why would you do that? What about this door looks welcoming? Nothing. There's nothing. There's not one thing that says, hey, man, come in, take your shoes off and have a nice dinner. Shit. Ass that didn't it's belong off, there. Man. The walls of this small room were lined with old yellowed newspaper clippings. My eyes were drawn to a headline that sent chills down my spine. Devastating fire at local business claims numerous lives. The date was decades ago, but then I read something which sent chills down my spine. The articles detailed a tragic fire that had occurred on these very premises back when it was a bustling furniture market. Worse yet, amidst the images of the deceased, I saw a few familiar faces. The faces in the photos matched the apparitions haunting me. The realization hit me like a ton of bricks. The apparitions, the sounds, they were all echoes of this tragic past. But the horror didn't stop there. As I returned, the ghosts became more aggressive. Objects began to fly off shelves as if hurled by unseen forces. Knives from the kitchen counter were thrown in my direction, narrowly missing me. Scorching handprints appeared on the walls, leaving behind a smell of burnt flesh. I dodged and weaved, avoiding the flying debris, my mind racing. The diner was a tomb, a site of unspeakable tragedy and I was trapped within it. The spirits of those lost in the fire were restless, their pain and anger palpable. They were reaching out to me as I ran for the door again, only to find it locked yet again, so I ran back. Amidst the chaos, I stumbled upon more clippings, revealing another layer to the tragedy. There were rumors of foul play, suspicions that the fire was no accident. The owner at the time, a Mr. Sanders, was suspected of setting the blaze for insurance money. 
Though nothing was ever proven, the accusations cast a dark shadow over the tragedy. The atmosphere in the diner shifted again, the temperature dropping suddenly as if the very air was being sucked away. I felt an unnerving sensation of being watched, followed by something unseen. Each step I took was heavy, filled with dread. The walls of the diner seemed to close in on me, the faces of the victims in the newspaper clippings staring accusingly. Then it happened. A vision so vivid, it was as though I was transported to another time. I found myself inside the burning furniture market, surrounded by flames. The heat was suffocating, the screams of the trapped victims piercing the air. I felt their agony, their desperation. It was a glimpse into the hellish final moments of those who perished in the fire. Emerging from the vision, gasping for air, I understood the depth of the suffering that had occurred here. The diner was not just a building, it was a grave for those lost souls, a place where their pain still lingered, their cries for justice unheard. As I stood there reeling from the vision and the revelations, I heard a voice call out. This you is not the Bible. That is not revelations. And that is when it hit me. These trapped souls mistakenly thought that I was responsible for their deaths. I, I knew I had to find a way to calm the spirits, to prove that I was not the one responsible for their anguish. The task seemed impossible, but it was the only chance I had to escape this nightmare. Still reeling from the terrifying vision of the burning furniture market, I struggled to comprehend the full extent of the tragedy that had unfolded decades ago on the very ground where the McDonald's now stood. The air in the restaurant felt heavy, charged with the anguish and despair of the lost souls. As I navigated through the chaos of the haunted diner, the temperature okay, yeah. fluctuated wildly, plunging into an icy chill before surging to an oppressive heat that mimicked the flames of the past. The sensation of being followed by something unseen intensified, an invisible presence that seemed to hover just over my shoulder, its breath cold against my neck. In my panic state, I remembered the owner, Mr. Sanders, and the accusations leveled against him. Desperate for answers, I scoured the diner for any clues, any remnants of the past that could help me understand. That's when I noticed something I had overlooked before, a distinct ring with the letter S on Mr. Sanders' finger and an old, framed photograph on Shout the wall. Superman. The same ring I had seen on the raincoat woman's. The connection was undeniable. The restaurant, once a lively market, now rebuilt, held within its walls the echoes of a cursed past. The whispers of the tragedy were everywhere, in the very fabric of the building. The spirits, tormented and restless, seemed to be everywhere, their presence growing stronger, more oppressive with each passing moment. Suddenly, I was gripped by another vision, more intense and terrifying than the first. I was inside the burning market again, but this time, I was one of the trapped victims. I could oh. feel the searing heat of the flames, the smoke filling my lungs, the desperation and fear. The screams of the others oh around gosh. me were deafening. I could hear their pleas for help, feel their struggle as the fire consumed everything. Thumbnail. Jolted back to reality, I was left gasping for air, my heart racing. The vision had been so vivid, so real that it took me a moment to orient myself. The spirits were trying to communicate their pain, their story, through me. As I struggled to make sense of it all, the diner continued to descend into chaos. Objects were still flying off the shelves, Bro, the ghostly just, just apparitions window, growing in intensity and number. The scorching handprints on the wall seemed to multiply, a terrifying reminder of the fire's deadly grip. It was clear that the spirits mistook me for someone else, perhaps someone involved in the tragedy. The weight of their mistaken accusations was a heavy burden, their need for justice and release palpable. I had to find a way to convince them of my innocence, to quell their anger and help them find peace. Remembering the cryptic message on the tissue left by the woman in the raincoat, I realized what I had to do. The message, convince them or they will think it is you, was a warning, a clue to resolving this nightmare. I needed to communicate with the spirits, to let them know I was not the one responsible for their suffering. 
As the spirits converged on me, their anger reaching a fever pitch, I remembered the woman's abandoned raincoat. Driven by instinct, I searched it and found the ring with the distinct S. It was a piece of the puzzle, a connection to the past, to the tragedy, and possibly to Mr. Sanders himself. With the ring in hand, I prepared to confront the spirits, to share my revelation and hopefully bring them the peace they so desperately sought. The diner was a whirlwind of paranormal activity, with apparitions manifesting more aggressively than ever. Kitchen utensils flew through the air as if wielded by invisible, furious hands, narrowly missing me as I ducked and weaved through the chaos. The once familiar signs and menus came crashing down around me, creating a cacophony of noise and confusion. Amidst this turmoil, messages began appearing on the windows and mirrors, scrawled in what looked like soot. The words were desperate pleas for help, interspersed with vows of revenge. It was as if the tormented souls of the fire victims were reaching out through every available surface, seeking justice or release from their eternal suffering. The realization that the spirits mistook me for someone connected to their tragedy was a terrifying burden. They saw me as the key to their release or revenge, perhaps because of my presence in this cursed place. I recalled the woman's ominous words on the tissue, convince them or they will think it is you. It was a warning, a directive that I now understood all too well. As I clutched the ring with the distinct S, a symbol connecting me to the past, to Mr. Sanders, and to the woman in the raincoat, I prepared to make my stand. The spirits converged on me, their ethereal forms swirling with anger and pain. I felt their eyes upon me, their gaze heavy with accusation. In a moment of desperate courage, I raised my voice. I'm not who you think I am! I shouted, my words seemingly lost in the chaos. But I pressed on, driven by a need to quell their anger and bring them peace. I explained that I had no connection to the fire, to the tragedy that had befallen them. I was just a worker at the diner, unwittingly caught in the midst of their anguish. Holding up the ring, I implored them to see the truth. The ring was a symbol, a piece of the past that I had inadvertently become entwined with. I spoke of the woman in the raincoat, her mysterious message, and how I came to find myself in possession of the ring. The apparitions paused, their forms flickering as if in doubt. The intensity of their anger seemed to wane, replaced by a cautious curiosity. It was a moment of respite, a chance for me to reach out to them further. I pleaded with them to understand, to recognize that I was not the architect of their suffering. I spoke of my own fears and confusion, of being thrust into a nightmare I could not comprehend. My words were a mix of apology and explanation, a desperate plea for understanding. As I spoke, the chaos around me began to subside. The flying objects settled, the crashing signs stilled, and the messages on the mirrors and windows faded. The spirits, their forms less menacing now, seemed to be listening, their need for vengeance giving way to a desire for the truth. In that moment, I realized the power of acknowledgement, of giving voice to the pain and suffering of those long silenced. The spirits, bound by their tragic past, were seeking recognition, a chance to be heard and understood. Kneeling amidst the settling chaos of the diner, I clutched the ring tightly, a symbol of a tragic past that had inadvertently become part of my present. The spirits, now less aggressive, hovered around me, their forms flickering with residual anger and confusion. Gathering all the courage I had left, I addressed the spirits, my voice echoing in the now eerily silent restaurant. I killed him. I declared, the words heavy with a significance I had only just begun to understand. The spirits froze, their ethereal form still, as if processing my confession. I explained, my voice trembling but resolute, that my father had worked in the furniture shop that once stood here. He perished in the fire, a victim of the tragedy that had claimed so many lives. Years later, driven by a need for justice and retribution, I had sought out Mr. Sanders, the man suspected of causing the inferno. In a Crazy. moment of vengeance, I had confronted him, <clears throat> leading to his Crazy. death. The spirits listened, their forms becoming less intimidating, this more ethereal. Crazy. 
One by one, they began to vanish, their apparitions dissolving into the air, a sign that they were finally finding wow. peace. He's the knowledge that Sanders, the That's alleged architect of their suffering, was no longer of this murder world, okay. seemed to bring them the closure they mm -hmm. needed. <clears throat> I was joking. Murder is not okay. Don't don't go out there and start murdering. As the last okay. of the spirits disappeared, the this diner true. returned to its normal state. The oppressive atmosphere lifted, replaced by a surreal calm. I was left alone, the weight of the night's revelations heavy upon me. The door, previously locked, clicked open, oh. as if signifying the end of the ordeal. As I stepped outside, taking in the cool night air, I saw Police. her, the woman oh. in the raincoat. She approached me, her expression a mixture of gratitude and sorrow. She revealed herself to be Sanders' daughter. She explained that on her previous visits to the diner, she had experienced hostility from the spirits, drawn to the family ring she carried, a ring that once belonged to her father. Realizing the connection, she had devised a plan. By leaving the coat and locking the door, she hoped to create a scenario where the spirits, believing I was innocent, would find salvation. Her actions, though drastic, were driven by a desire to appease the restless souls, including that of my father. I listened, a mix of emotions swirling within me, relief, sadness, and a strange sense of kinship with this woman who had, in her own way, sought to right the wrongs of the past. Her apology was sincere, and in the bizarre turn of events that had unfolded, I found myself married. forgiving her. In a surprising gesture, she asked me out on a date, a small mm -hmm. but significant step towards healing and moving forward from the horrors of the past. We stood there, two people connected by a shared history of loss and suffering, looking towards a future where the pain of the past could finally be laid to rest. As I walked away from the diner, the first light of dawn breaking over the horizon, I felt a sense of closure. The spirits of the fire victims had found peace, and with them, a part of me had found peace too. The diner, once a site of tragedy, now stood as a testament to the resilience of the human spirit and the power of truth and reconciliation. Man, this was a pretty crazy one, and I didn't expect him to be a murderer or anything like that, but you know, life is full of surprises and stuff. But anyway, man, if you enjoyed this one, leave a like, comment, subscribe, share, turn the post notification bells on so you can see when I post, if you're really banging with me, of course. And peace, love, and positivity, and I will catch y'all in the next one. It's two options in this world, is you gonna win or lose? Is you gonna take the risk or not, you know you gotta choose. Yeah, I can't keep one, so all my bitches come in twos.